him. What did you say? I know that he's special, but I want him to be special here because he's always gone, and he's going to be gone even more since that they did this. Oh, boy, that's a really tough one. Kyle, that's a tough question from a, from, from a lot of kids who, whose, uh, whose parents are serving the rest of us. Uh, how, can you help Megan there and the rest of us? And Megan is saying something that Eric was saying that others have said, I want to know my family is safe. Right. Are we going to be all right? Will the people that I love be all right? And what Megan shows us with her honesty is that it is her emotion and her feeling that actually is going to make her all right in the end, her ability to ask her mom to stay near me, to say to dad, I know you're going to be helpful to other people, but I want you here in the end, dad. And as I, as I look at Megan's sadness and tears about it, I'm reminded how many children in America are feeling a good deal of distress, not the ones that are just here in New York in the physical proximity, but all over the country, are having trouble sleeping. They feel jumpy. They feel uncertain about tomorrow. Red was talking, I hope it's OK, Red, uh, by tell that he said he was really developed a stutter after this had begun. And so many of you, we saw after the challenge disaster that almost 2 thirds of children in these very age groups uh, were, were having upsets, eating, sleeping at night, a little irritable, paying attention in school, often for weeks to months afterward. Those things will ease and go away. Um, is that a promise, Kyle? That is a, as much of a promise as I can. You guys hear that very clearly? I do not know. You very, please, you've got to tell us that again. That, that will settle down. Much of what you're feeling, the jumpiness, I know Kamaya said, yes, it does make me feel safe, Mr. <laughs> Jennings, but it took her a while to answer. She's not absolutely certain. And so in six to seven weeks, some of what you are feeling here, some of what you are feeling around the country will begin to ease. The one exception to that, and you heard it here before when we were talking about safety, is that many of the adolescents are already beginning to wonder about the future for them. Terrorism is never more obscene than when you try to explain it to children. We have here children here trying to explain it. That is why the closeness, why why Megan's dad pulled her close to him. We need to pull our children close to us and make the sacrifices to be with them during this time. They will need it all too soon. They will push you away and say, go back. Thanks very much. I'm all fine. Everything's taken care of. But um, we have heard the truth over and over again spoken here as we've tried to explain what's happened to us. So thank you, Megan. Thank you, Megan, very much. Uh, and Mrs. Robbins, to Julia. Can I have a question? Sure. I was wondering, the terrorists, do, if they have children, are the children behind them, or are they trying to tell their parents that they're doing the wrong thing? Oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. <laughs> well, I think it's kind of unfair to ask Ozzy that, that, that question. Who'd, who'd like to try to answer that? What an extraordinary question. What about the parents of the terrorists who came and attacked America? Um, well, you're sp oh, okay. That's really interesting. I just heard in my ear that that uh, that that a colleague of mine named Bob Woodruff, uh, maybe we could put him up on the screen there at the moment, uh, may have something of an answer to this. I bet none of you would know. Well, you, there's no reason you should know. But Bob Woodruff is in Pakistan this morning, right next to Afghanistan. And Bob, that is some tough question. Do you think the parents, or do you have any reason to understand generally that parents support what kids do when they do violence against others? Well, Peter, you've seen this before in the Middle East and a lot of places. It's probably one of the most upsetting things that you see is, uh, you know, children out on the street that are doing exactly what the parents are doing. Uh, you know, the kids uh, are taught from a very early age in some of these places to hate and to envy. You know, what really strikes me when you get to these countries that a lot of other kids have never been to, and Ameri American kids have never been to, is just how, how poor they are in many places. And imagine that you're a child in one of these places, and you don't have a lot of money, you don't have a, a, a lot. And uh, you see newspapers and magazines and television reports of all the g tremendous wealth that there is in America. Well, that you know, creates some envy. And then you just imagine that your parents say, well, you know what? There's a reason why you don't have as much as other people, like in America. 
It's because the American people are doing it on purpose, because they don't want you to have that kind of thing. And then that turns that kind of envy into hatred. And then how that moves to, to murder is, an, is another story. But it, this starts at a very early age. For example, here in Pakistan, there are a lot of religious schools. The government, uh, about 40 to 50,000 religious schools that they call madrasas. And the government says that uh, about 10 to 15 percent of these schools teach a very radical uh, form of theology to these kids. And, and in fact, it, it teaches them to hate. That's very interesting, Bob. And in fact, you're right. I've been to those madrasa schools, and, and they're rigid. But as you were talking, there were two people here really shaking their heads quite violently, two adults. And I'll come back to you kids in just one sec. But one of you is Rogida. I actually happen to know Rogida. You're a journalist, and you're, and you're from the Middle East. And, um, why are we shaking your head so vigorously? Be because it's uh, too bad that the, the presentation by a fellow journalist is that in that part of the world, they teach in their schools hatred. There are some madrasas, as you refer to, which means schools that are, uh, that, that, yeah, they, are they belong to those mm -hmm. particular individuals who have that direction. It's a very shallow statement to say all of them out there. I also wanted to okay, answer but, this. But talk to Julia. Yeah, exactly. Julia, Julia, Julia is the one who asked the question. I, what I are think their I understood the question to be, do these terrorists have children? This is how I understood the question. Is, is this right, the right Julia? question? Was it, was it, did they have children, or what did their parents think? Or was it, it both? It was basically, were the children affected by what the parents did? Like, oh, did yeah. the parents, like, actually want the children to see what they were doing and follow them? That's interesting. How do, what makes you think these, these, these guys were old enough to have children? Well, I was talking with my family last <laughs> night at dinner, and we were thinking about what happened with the World Trade Center. And we wanted to know what was going on in the family. Like, maybe it was something that had to do with, like, the maybe they had a fight or something, and they didn't know how to, like, show it so they like bombed the world trade center mm -hmm. well, that's an interesting thought you know but, but Regina, yeah, would you Peter, that's it but the, can i just try the more the basic question let's say these guys these guys did have children or let's say uh or let and they certainly had parents um is there a relationship in this part of the world uh, that you're talking about between parents and children and violence when I, uh, I had a personal experience when I interviewed someone who was associated, of course, he was called the mastermind behind the World Trade Center first explosions. And when I sat with him in prison, that was Ramzi Youssef. Mm. And when I sat with him in prison, and then I was trying, we were all trying to learn about him. When I understood that he, that when he was on the run, married and had children, I was absolutely shocked. And I said, how could you as a father go ahead and do that sort of thing. And he thought that he was doing the right thing for whatever his cause is. But that, that Osama bin Laden has just married off his son. But the thing is, I don't really know if, if it's the idea is to group those people, again, Muslims and Arabs, because exactly uh, the enemy of the people here in the, in the United States or over the world who are Muslims or Arabs, this is the terrorism is their enemy. The whole idea of terror terrorizing us is to stop thinking, to stop thinking of what's the right thing to do. And I think with my own child, who is here, Thalia, I, the most important thing for me is that we go on thinking, evaluating if we're doing right or wrong. Regardless, the, the idea that to say with, behind these horrifying attacks is to say America is hated. Look around. Everybody is telling America, we love you. Mm. The whole world is standing with America. So don't be afraid. This is not about hating America. That's very interesting. Um, Francis. Um, hi, my name is Francis. And um, as to the question of if the children are influenced, I believe that um, the kids have a power to like accept or not accept what the parents believe in. And in school, we're, we've been talking about um, the terrorists. And we believe that these people have so much hatred in them and that they're willing to sacrifice their lives to like just Go, go for their cause. And they, be, they probably believe that if they do this, they're not only doing it for the benefit for the, of, of their belief, but to their children. And as you grow up as adolescents, you actually, like, you, act, you don't really hmm. believe everything that your parents say. You actually have your own mind in, 
um, ideas. Do you mean to say that you don't believe everything your parents No, tell you? actually, no. I mean, like, if you think about it, like, this is why so many kids rebel. Like, because we, as kids, we believe everything our parents said. But as you grow up, you actually learn that not everything that they do right and wrong. And um, these kids, probably, they could accept it. They could say, okay, my parents are right. Like, these peop the people in America are bad. But then again, these kids have also the power to just like separate themselves from that hatred and change the future. And um, and I think that they what the terrorists did is horrible. And if these kids believe in what their parents killed themselves for, then I think it's up to us in America and other parts of the country to like fight that because hatred is not is not in terrorist itself. It begins within ourselves. No, it's very interesting, <clears throat> at least to my ears anyway. Um, I'll come to you one sec, I promise. Um, we keep seeming to come back to this notion of hatred. We keep coming back to, to hatred and resentment and bigotry. Carson Daly from MTV. Do you ever get to talk about this there, whether or not our culture teaches hatred and uh, or other cultures teach hatred? Is, is this part for tolerance? Do you, do you do we teach tolerance? You know, it's not really, um, it's not part of my world every day, but uh, I think it's so important that we sit here and talk about it. Um, I think the notion of anybody teaching hatred um, is, is, uh, is horrible. I don't, I don't know how. Uh, A lot of people, some, I mean, older people, I grant you, right? A lot of people, old, mostly older, I think they sometimes hear it in our music. Yeah. What do you think? Well, there's, you know, it's interesting. In, in, in the hip hop culture, um, music is is, uh, is a reflection of a lot of uh, reality, and some older people don't like to to recognize how some people are are living, and, and a lot of it uh, is reflected in lyrics, and um, it can be a great tool to better uh, help understand how some of our young people are actually living. Mm -hmm. So it can be great. When you hear something, this is just pure curiosity for me. Maybe I'm a happy kid because you listen to everything. Uh, do you hear hatred in there sometimes? Sure. What do you do when you, when you hear it? Well, you, I guess you try and understand maybe w where it's coming from so that there's some, uh, some way of uh, eliminating it. The best thing we can do is, I, sometimes, you know, I've been fearful all week, you know, just living here and um, educating ourselves, being a part of discussions is just, has been so helpful mm -hmm. for me. You know, like what Dr. Butts said, I mean, um, if we can just learn more about each other, we start to just generally feel a little bit better. So I think to get to the, to the root of hatred and try and understand where it's stemming from, because it's somebody's reality somewhere, you know, it, would, it would be good to know a little bit more about it. I just want to add one thing. I, I don't mean to turn this into the counseling corner No, 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 no. It, just, it goes to what this young lady says. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't see your name here. <coughs> Francis in terms of, of having your own mind. I, I believe it's really important for every kid in this room and every kid that's watching this to know that they can make a choice, that hatred isn't something that you have to have, um, whether it's reflected, however you see it reflected, that right now every one of you can make a choice how, how you want to respond to this. And if you want to respond to it in a hateful way or if you want to respond to it and if you're able to respond to it in, in a different way, such as when you were able to walk down the street with your friends and, and face the world um, and, and move into it in a different way, that it, it's about choices and you have the power to make choices. Uh, come on, I want to, I know, it, it, we, you, we, you, listen, I promise you'll be six foot tall one of these days, <laughs> right, at the moment. This is Jake. Yeah, Jake. Well, I have a question about planes. Planes, okay. <laughs> What happens if they close the cops door the pilots, but they like another two other hijackers like barge into the door and hijack them again and drive the plane into another building. What do you think they'll do for safety that? Well, that's a very good question. Do you, do you feel safe this week? Sort of. <laughs> yeah, what sort of mean? Um, yes. Were you one of the ones who said earlier that when you see an airplane right now you get nervous? No. No. That was you, was it, Dexter? Okay. 
I, mean, I, you know, I don't know the answer to that question, but I think, and, is John, and I think John Nance has gone away. John Nance has gone away, I think, at the moment. And, but I think the answer is, oh, I beg your pardon. There he is. John, uh, uh, that's a tough call. Uh, could you try that one briefly for us? You want to? I, I heard part of what Jake said, Peter, but not all of it. Well, what happens? Uh, tell me if I get it right, Jake. If, if, if two terrorists were to get into the cockpit and two others were on the outside, Use the mic. If two um, terrorists break in and hijack the plane and drive it into another building, what do you think they'll do for safety after that? Oh, you mean you mean if 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 this happens to the United States again, is that what yeah. you're saying? If this happens to the United States again, um, then how are you going to still make the country safe? Do you actually think it might happen to the United States again? You know, well that's very reassuring. That's a tough question, John. I'm not sure you can answer that, but give it a whirl. I really, the only thing I can say about that is that we're going to try everything we can to make sure it never happens again. But good grief, if it does, then everything that we put in place has to be redoubled. I guess it's just that, that specter, that worry is some possibility that that could ever happen again is what's going to drive us to change things. Yeah, well, that's a, yeah, that's a really interesting question and answer, isn't it, Jake? Because it means that everybody who has real, well, you really are down there, aren't you? <laughs> I think I think what I think what John is saying is that because this has happened the one time, everybody and I can tell you listening to everybody in the country this week, everybody in the country who has any authority in the country this week has been so conscious and so frightened, just like the rest of us, by what happened, that I think they are working a hundred times harder than you can imagine to make to do the best they can, because you can never make anything in life completely sure, but they're doing the very best they can to see that it doesn't happen again. And I now see up on the screen somebody I know who can help us with this. This is Martha Raditz, and she's actually at the Pentagon today. And you all know that uh, one of the aircraft crashed into the Pentagon. And I also know that Martha has one or two kids. I've forgotten which it is. But Martha, can you try to answer Jake's question? For those people who are afraid that this is going to happen again, how do we prevent that? Well, my own Jake asked the same question. And he has some very good follow-up questions all the time. I think I can't give a simple answer. The one thing I will say is this. My son, my nine-year-old son, is well aware that there were safety measures in place before. In fact, he was very frightened after the Africa bombings because he has parents who are journalists. He knows a little more about these things than others. And I assured him at that time that they couldn't get into this country. I feel very guilty about that now. So what I say now is, they made some mistakes. They made some big mistakes in gathering intelligence, in making our country safe. And you think about mistakes you've made in your life. Think about mistakes you've made in school. And once you make those mistakes, you never want to make them again. You're going to get better at that. You're going to do just what Peter says. You're going to go 100% all over the country in any way you can make us safe. And you also, I love listening to you kids because you have the most wonderful answers. What we can gather from the fear we all feel, we can also gather inspiration. And I think that's such a wonderful thing. You've got it all from each other. You've got it from the firefighters. So we've learned wonderful lessons out of this. And we'll definitely learn lessons about security. They are going to do the best they possibly can. You know what's really hard for Martha at the moment? Her phone's ringing. And she, Martha, this is a wonderful answer. Thank you very much. But you better go answer your phone because Martha's on the job at the Pentagon today and somebody may want her or may have news. And that's what Martha does. She does it for us at the Pentagon and she does it for us at the State Department. And, and, and it's, it's, it's folks like her who get answers like that. Well, an awful lot of hands up. Um, I, I don't know. Who have I, to be fair, put your hands down for one second. Who have I not heard from? Ah, okay. Well, you were quick there, Jordan. Could we give Jordan, and I haven't heard from Justin up in the back. Let's hear from Jordan first and then Justin. Um, I just wanted to say that what, like, if, um, if, this do, if this does happen again, how will the pilot, how will the pilots react to it? What will they do? Will they have enough security to defend it? What will, they, what will happen? Well, I actually think we had something of an answer earlier that from John Nance that, and, and also from Martha, too which is to say people are working really hard at the moment to see, and you heard the president talk about this, 
and you heard the Secretary of Defense talk about this, I think everybody in the country, and you heard a lot of pilots talking about it, and I think everybody in the country at the moment is working really very hard to make sure that pilots and passengers are going to be a lot safer. And I'll give you one small example. Uh, after these guys did this thing, uh, there was another incident. There were two other incidents, in fact, three other incidents that I can think of. There was an incident at Kennedy Airport, and there was an incident at LaGuardia Airport here in New York City, and there was an incident in, in uh, Los Angeles, and I think there was one in Denver, and I think there was one in 15. And what I mean by incident is people caught people. Now, I'm not saying the people they caught were guilty. And the people were suspicious enough and careful enough careful enough, I think that's the most important thing now, to make sure that something that maybe was developing didn't happen. So I think people are really trying very hard. Is it Dustin up top? Dustin? I have a question for John, what if you're still there. What your hat says, first of all? What? What does your hat say, first of all? At Nice. <laughs> okay, thanks. For Justin, okay. Uh, I have a question for John. Right. For um, John Nance? Yeah. Okay. With the terrorists that are still out there running around, are the airports safe being uh, their opening? Another very good question. John, you know, we live in a society in, in which all of us travel. I asked these kids earlier how many of them had been on an airplane, and almost all of their hands went up. So is it safe to go to the airport now? I really believe it is. Uh, I think it's going to get even safer over time, but I think that what we've got right now is we know the names of a lot of these people, these evil individuals that are associated with it. The FBI is looking for them. And the airports are paying 50 times more attention to this, plus there are armed guards everywhere. I, yeah, I think it's safe to go to the airport. I would. I wouldn't have any hesitation. That's really nice. Thanks, John. That's really good for, for everybody to hear that, that. And the president said that the other day. You know, the president was asked himself, you know, would you, if you told your kids to fly, would it be okay? Yes, Drew. Um, I also have a question for John. Um, I was wondering, I know that It'll take me a while to feel comfortable going on an airplane, but I was wondering if you feel um, secure that you, if you um, trust the security enough to not be scared when you fly an airplane. As a passenger or as a pilot? I mean, what? As a passenger or a pilot? A pilot. A pilot. I think we're all traumatized right now, uh, and another I think that one, until we get some things words, changed, John. like uh, tougher doors, things that I was talking about before, I don't think we're going to feel as secure as we'd like to feel, but I can tell you we'll be doing things a lot differently as pilots, and uh, to that extent we're safe. I don't think any of us are going to be afraid to fly. We're just going to be extremely cautious, just like Peter was mentioning. Many thanks, John. By the way, how many of you kids um, in the last several days have felt you, you wanted to do something for somebody else? Oh, that is very encouraging. Take a look at what's happening in Chicago. This is happening everywhere. Take a look at what's happening in Chicago. Kids doing something for somebody else. This week, a terrible thing happened in our country. And many of you have written letters and poems to the governor of New York. If you brought your letters today, hold them high. Let me see if, if you brought letters that you've written to, and banners, hold your banners up, your pictures. Oh, thank you. And your flags, if you made flags in class, I'd like to see those. Excellent. Dear New York, we're very sorry for what some bad men did to you. They killed innocent people and crushed your towers too. We are thinking about you all the time and you have our support. You have so much of our support in our town that when we were giving blood donations, the clinic had to close because there were too many people giving blood. We are with you all the way. I hope you can move on from that dismal day. I hope you feel better and I hope my letter will help you. Although your buildings have tumbled, your spirit has not. America is strong and your sacrifice will not be forgot. God bless America every day. God bless each and every one of us in the USA.
How many of you think the president's doing a good job? Everybody is, am I right? Well, almost everybody, it'll do, certainly. Um, I, I've, there's so much to, to go on with at, at the moment. Um, but, I, but Charlie, and I, I know this is a kid's program, but Charlie, I just asked Charlie why he had his hand up all the time <coughs> at, at the very back. I thought you were waving to your mother, Charlie. But, the, uh, but, but then I went over and asked him, what's your question? And I think it's a good question for parents, <coughs> and it's to Kyle, and it's a good question for parents and for kids, so I think we'll all get something out of it. Yeah, go ahead. Well, Kyle, basically my question your would be, up. we know the children are exposed to this. Obviously, we've just seen that film clip, and it's obvious that it's widespread, their exposure. At what point should the exposure maybe stop? Should children stop seeing this incident over and over and over and repeat it on TV? Because uh, it is frightening. You know, and, and we know they're exposed, and we know they've seen it, but they have, have they seen enough of it? When Sam's pictures were coming up, there were some winces among the kids around here seeing these pictures again. And I think that the time to sort of slow the exposure is, is yesterday, Charlie, uh, especially for younger children. Uh, one of the reasons the younger ones are having trouble sleeping at night is the images of frightened and out of control adults is a very frightening thing for very young children. Now. You also, there's an age range difference. The older kids are very anxious to have every bit of information from their friends, often instant messaging, everything needs to be processed over and over again. You heard in this very program, one question was asked three to four different times. That's not because no one's paying attention, Charlie. It's because the children need to ask the questions over and over again. We know that the more exposure they have to troubling visual images, the, the, the longer it's going to take for their heart and heart rate to settle down and become more comfortable. I've talked to many children in the last few days who have said, I'd rather look at the newspaper than the television. The television is too much. Mm -hmm. um, I've had children sort of say to me, I, my mom and dad want to talk about it all the time, and I really don't. And there are some mm -hmm. children who don't want to talk about it, period. But in three to four weeks, you know, they may, there may be a trigger that comes to them. The, the smoke out of a burning pile of leaves may look like this image, and these fears will come back, the jet, low-flying jet in the plane. So I think we need to be thinking all the time as parents about uh, trying to mediate our children's exposure to this. And the last thing I want to say, Charlie, I'm very glad you asked it, is the way we talk about this with our children, frankly, is as important, if not more, than what we say. And so we have to sort of settle our own hearts and fears, think about what we believe, talk with our friends, and then sort of tr try to address it with our children. Um, as, as Pat and her daughter demonstrated to us before, we as parents are going to actually have a lot of help and support from our children. <laughs> I've heard some of that today. They will, mm -hmm. they will hold us, reassure mm -hmm. us, and say, help me with this. What is going on? And kids, that is one of the things you can do to help your parents. Say, I need to talk about this. Listen to me. It is one of the great things you can do. I have to tell you just one other thing, and I, this is going to sound a little more defensive than it's, than it's meant to, but um, we were very conscious of that with all of our coverage in the last couple of days, and I think we went yesterday uh, for you know, 20 hours and never saw the images again. I mean, some of us have kids too, and we remember from the past that if you run these images over and over and over again, it's tough. Well, that's but why I'm I, here this morning and not on some other network. <laughs> well, thank you. I didn't, I didn't mean to, no, to, to solicit right. a compliment there. But I have a question for you on behalf of these other kids. Okay, I appreciate it. This is a very, very profound question. Now, we all, of course, want to just watch nothing but cartoons. <laughs> Go ahead, let them handle that one. <laughs> <laughs> There's a version of that that I've also heard from some adolescents who said, you know, when I saw this, I didn't feel as bad about it as I thought I, was, I should. I thought I should, you know, I had friends who were really upset, and I just watched it. And, I, and one of them said to me, you know, maybe I've just rented Independence Day too often. Yeah? Um, it's because, interesting. You know, you know, forgive me for interrupting. Yeah. I apologize. And I heard, I've heard uh, Joelle and a lot of others today um, use, not so much today, but just generally since, all of you uh, using language about what should be done sounds to me right out of the movies. That's a, a takedown is one that keeps sticking with me. Yeah. And I, I think the, the rule here is, as parents and as kids, there is nothing that you can feel about this that is wrong. You will all feel what you need to feel. And if you do feel a little desensitized and a little cut back from this, 
Uh, count yourself a little lucky and a little fortunate because most of you, it'll catch w up with you sooner or later. Do you think it'll catch up with, with, with all of us? I mean, I know some kids who <clears throat> it, hasn't, it hasn't clicked. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, these kids, I'm sure, are very happy. To, are you all happy to hear to say that it's okay to think anything you want, and mm -hmm. and and you know that life will life will get get on with it. I, I do think it's important for parents to hear there are kids who mm -hmm. are going to about a third of the kids, for example, after the challenger, never had a, a negative reaction or that never came back to get them. But I think parents need to be cautious mm -hmm. about pushing or nudging your children too hard to talk about this or feel a little nudge is probably okay. <coughs> But there are some children who will think about this in their own way at another time and another place, and that is fine. Okay, you can all remember that when you go home. If your parents insist on wanting to talk about it after this program, you just have Dr. Cal tell them to talk about it later. Thank you very much. <laughs> some, some parents, and you may want to need time. Now, Daniel, you've been very good, and I'm not quite... Go ahead, your turn. Um, in my school, we have the Red Cross for the firefighters everywhere, and in the, in, on the... Show we saw before that the kids everywhere around America should keep keep on doing this and ha and sending blood for the pe the firefighters and the people that need it. Well, you know, kids aren't old enough to give blood. Um, what else could you do? I should, what else? What, what else do you think we, we could do? I mean, if you're not old enough to give blood. Well, you can start donating things and giving things to the firemen. Mm. It's true, they need some things. Uh, did I see a list? Do we have a list somewhere of somewhere of the things that kids can do? Take, uh, do we have that? Some, somewhere, I think, in our files here, somebody gave us a list of things that we thought that kids could do for other people. And you know, the, we got a lot of telephone calls and a lot of emails asking us to help the firemen, so that's a, that's a really good question. Interesting. Now, who, have I not, who else have I not heard from? Not heard from. Yes. Uh, but, um, but, um, I can't see because of your hair. Nora. Nora. Hi. Oh, hold it, Nora. I apologize. There is something there. You can collect money for the disaster victims. You can plant a tree as a memorial. <laughs> you can design cards and write notes to someone involved in the disaster. You know, there's someone in, in, in my building and someone in so many buildings who we know who's having a terrible time. And you can write a poem or a story for a class book about the disaster. That's interesting. Okay, thanks a lot. And um, Nora. Yeah, I think it's very important to get back to the question why. And these people, like Julie said, with their families, and what has the United States done to install such hatred into these people's hearts? What do you think? Well, for one thing, putting sanctions into countries where you can't, where the, they can't have, they don't have, the kids don't have enough food to eat, and medicine, and putting bombs and killing them. I mean, are we only getting a taste of our own medicine? Uh, we're doing this to the rest of the world, too. Well, that's pretty tough. Anybody agree with that? Any kids agree that, uh, that, we're, that the United States is getting a taste of its own medicine and that people in other parts of the world are... Uh, what was the rest of the part of that question? Mm -hmm. Statement? Uh, well, are there the people, the terrorists, I mean, they're horrible and awful for doing what they did. But then again, were their families killed in any of these things? That's because it takes a lot for a person to commit suicide, not to, alone to commit suicide, and take 10,000 people with them. That's a lot. You got an answer to that, James, or at least a comment? Well, I don't think we're getting a taste of our own medicine, but we're definitely doing something to make some people really mad. And um, one of the steps we have to take so we don't get in a war or anything to figure out what that is <coughs> and correct it and try to make everyone, try to not make mm. uh, everyone really mad and everything. Does anybody else want to talk, I'm talking to kids now, forgive me, Jerry, I'm gonna, I mean, a kid want to talk specifically to that point, that point. Specifically, give Evan a microphone. Oh, and, and, and Michael, want, Michael, you have a mic. You want to talk specifically about that question? Does it, 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 um, I agree with her in some parts, like, because we have been helping um, other countries and like planting bombs in people's homes and all along the streets. So when like, kids would come out to play, they'd step on a mine and then it would just blow up. And uh, I think we kind of are getting a taste of our own medicine. Ooh. But we, um, I don't think that it should have been taken down to two of the biggest things that resemble our country 
the most, and the Pentagon. That's really very interesting. Thank you. First, Connor, briefly, and then Kelly. Um, well, I just want to say, um, Nora, I don't really think that what we're doing is getting a taste of our own medicine because as the things that we might do and the things that we, we might say and things, we do not intentionally, unless that country has committed an act of war upon us, kill thousands of innocent people. That's not what we do. All right, let her, let her answer. Well, are we always getting the whole story on the news? Do we? Oh, don't. <laughs> don't grab. Don't grab. She'll well, what I'm trying to say is that people are dying in other countries. Are we using our power more to cause destruction across the world than help people? We have wealth and all this, and maybe they're jealous, but don't you think maybe they have a good reason to be? Give them the mic. Well, they certainly have reason to be jealous. We have a lot, and our country is very lucky, but it's not our fault that they're not. I mean, you might think on some level, well, we should be helping them, and we should. We should be helping people who are less fortunate than us. But if people who are less fortunate than us, who we might have not gotten around to yet, are going to sell building, uh, are going to sell planes into our office buildings. We're not going to let them do that. All right. One last comment from Nora, and then I want to move on. Well, what are we doing to them? That's what I'm trying to say. We're doing. We for how long have these people been suffering? Just a second. No. The <laughs> <laughs> these people don't. They, you're saying they don't have enough to eat. How do they even have the power to come down here? and do such horrible things to us. All right, Jeffrey, uh, uh, Kelly, People I said, Kelly, I, oh, I apologize. Sorry, I, yeah, yeah, <laughs> right, right. I'll, I'll take it for just a moment, if I may. <laughs> you know something? I have to tell you, something. I, what you're talking about is very, very serious. Very, very serious. Let's hear from Kelly. I agree with what Connor said, because we didn't earn it. We didn't force them to come and bomb us. That was their choice. We're not telling them, OK, we did it, do you come bomb us? OK, if we did it, then we had a good reason. Okay, it might not have been a good one, but we had a reason. Joel? I want to thank you for what you said, Noah, because... Nora? No, Nora, yeah. Um, I want to thank you a lot because I've been wanting to say that through this whole time. I know I said a lot, but I really want to say that because what she was, what she was talking about, you know David and Goliath, Pastor, um, how David asked the Lord to give strength to hurt, to um, take down Goliath. Well, we've been bombing them. I'm, it's, it's true. We've been bombing them, and we don't mean to kill their families, but we do. And they don't care whether we mean to or not. So, I mean, so are they, are they like, oh, they're the bad guys, so let me pray to the Lord, and let me be David, and let me kill, let me make sure that these guys get a taste of what they're doing to us. <coughs> that's, why, that's why I'm so confused. Dr. Butts, that's a very good question. Everyone would like to claim God for his or her own cause. But I still think that it's important, whether it's the David and Goliath story or, or any other story from the Quran or from the Bible, to recognize that God does not side with the destruction. God does not intend for one human being to destroy another. You know, it's like, you know, my football team wants to win, so I pray to God for a victory. You can't say that God is on the side of the Jets and not the Vikings. Uh, what you must, you must begin to understand that God is no respecter of nationality or race or even religion. God is not, you know, a, a respecter of these. These are, are human created things. God is a God of us all. And therefore, it is our own uh, allegiance to God, our faith in God, that causes us to respect one another. So even mm. in the David and Goliath story, that represents more uh, 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 of uh, your ability mm. in your meager resources to overcome larger obstacles. That does not represent that because you are uh, uh, American and somebody else is something else that you're right and they're wrong. That's very interesting. Dr. Butts, let me just ask you one question. One question. There's no football this weekend. Uh, right? You a Jets fan? Yes. Yeah. You're a Giants fan or a Jets fan? 
I'm both because I'm a well, New Yorker. I yeah, but I mean, <laughs> you, you, you're, you're a, you, 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 you admitted there to being a Jets fan. Now, let me ask you, on Friday night or on Saturday, don't you ever ask just for a little extra help? No. I think that that's, <laughs> I think it's very dangerous because for young people, <clears throat> to place God on the side of one or the other confuses. No, I know. I was just kidding, sure. to be perfectly honest. Another Jennings joke fell flat in a pancake. <laughs> 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 All right, I apologize. But I must tell you, uh, we, are, we, we really believe in balance around here. We really believe in balance. And having heard that, uh, that you're a Jets fan, I remember I didn't bring this up. We also have as a guest today Bart Oates. <laughs> who is the former center for the New York Giants and the San Francisco 49ers. And uh, we're thrilled to have you here. And, you. and it's your daughter you brought? I brought my daughter, Skylar, my son, Zach, and my wife, Michelle. What do you think of the conversation here today? Because um, kids and us, we all look up a lot to you guys, a lot of you guys who are athletes, not all of you, but a lot of you. It's been very enlightening to uh, listen to the conversation and to... Uh, I spend the last several hours just listening and reflecting upon some of my own thoughts and perspectives and the experiences of the past week as an individual and as a family. Um, and, and what's been probably most poignant in my mind as uh, this dis discussion has taken place is the need um, for understanding, um, the need for uh, perspective in realizing that um, you know, we have such diversity in our country. And that's what's made us great. And, um, you know, in, in the need for uh, learning and, uh, from history. Uh, after uh, Pearl Harbor was bombed, which is probably the closest thing you could um, correlate uh, this event to, uh, you know, we went out and uh, interred uh, American and Japanese Americans, uh, some of them for months and months at a time. We don't see that. Uh, I think we've become more diverse. We, we are more understanding, but we need to become more so. Um, and so it, it's been interesting. So you, you, I think I hear you saying, and I think, I'm going to find out if these kids agree with you. I think you're saying that the strength of America is because we're all different. No question about it. That's, what, that's why America is special, uh, aside from any other country. Uh, there's no other country in the world that has the diversity and encourages the type of diversity that we encourage. Um, and we have a long ways to go. We're not mm -hmm. perfect, uh, but it is a, a goal, and it, I think it's an ambition of, of many of the citizens, yeah. and as we've discussed today. Uh, we, we haven't got an awful lot of time left, I'm, I'm, I'm sad to say. We've got about four minutes left. I'm going to sort of work, and I'd like to fiddle with this question for a second. I'm going to use this hand mic, number eight, for a second, um, and just ask you just to give me a yes or no answer, Annie. Do you think we're a better country because we're all different? I don't think we're better, but I think that it's good that we're all different because we learn a lot from being around people of different nationalities and races and religions. That's really interesting. Thanks. What about you, Eric? Do you think we're better because we're different? Well, or all different, right? Yeah, but not not better, just like we're all, I don't know how to explain it actually. Yeah. Well, that's all right. Give it a try. I tell you, I'll come back to you in one second. Let me go to, a, let me go to the back room here. I can't, is it Eva? Reva. Reva, I'm sorry. Do you think we're better because of, there's so many of the we, so we're also different in some ways? Yeah, I think we are because you get different experiences. You talk to people who've been through things that you never have and have different backgrounds and you just become more accepting of other people. You can't become totally racist or anything. Okay, and totally racist or anything. And uh, Carly, do you think we're better? I think we're better because if we were all the same, life would be like boring and we wouldn't have different experience. We'd just all be the same. I'm going to ask you to be really short, yeah? Um, I think that it's better that we're all the same because if imagine every day being everyone being the same, it's like it would just be horrible. Just everyone being the same, it'd be just like Carly said, boring. Well, that's really terrific. I really appreciate it. Uh, I mean, I didn't talk to you enough of you on that last question, but. But hearing the notion that you celebrate the differences, that you celebrate the differences in America is really terrific for us. And, and I want to thank you tremendously. Thank you tremendously. We can keep talking, by the way, here. We just got to give the program back to the network. Um, but it's really terrific that, I, that you've been so smart and so thoughtful. And I, I just, it's just been wonderful for us. And thanks, all you. 
older folks as well, too. <laughs> now, <clears throat> I hope they know that they're applauding themselves. By the way, we got a lot of, uh, a lot of these questions from abcnews.com, and as you know, this is a conversation that can keep going through abcnews.com just for as long as you want. They'll put up with you if you'll put up with them. And we're going to, we're going, there's, there's also a, a chat at 1 p.m. at ESPN with Ghazi. You're going to go online and, and, and talk to folks there at abcnews.com as well. And we're going to do something very, that I happen to think is interesting on, on ABC this afternoon because we're not going to return to regular programming. But we are going to rerun something I and a lot of kids had a lot of fun doing, which was a program on the century, on the 20th century, which was seen on ABC. And so we had a wonderful time making that. We talked to a lot of people what they thought it was like growing up in the 20th century. And so on ABC this afternoon, all those century programs on ABC News. Thank you again for everybody. And let me remind you, take a look, take a look, at, take a look at the folks. Take a picture, folks. They're still working there like nobody's business, trying as best they can to help someone else. Thanks very much indeed for coming.